Welcome to Childhood Under Occupation, a podcast by Defence for Children International, Palestine. My name's Salson. In this first episode of our podcast, I catch up with my colleague, Brad Parker, and ask him to share his expertise on international law, juvenile justice and child rights, and to set the scene for the upcoming episodes. Like many human rights organisations, our staff are spread across the globe, from London to Palestine to New York, where Brad is based. <laughs> Sorry. Um... Brad is our senior advisor on policy Wait, and me, advocacy, me and he's been with I'll, us I'll for read, around a decade. <laughs> yeah, I'll, okay. I'll ask it again. I first asked Brad where human rights come from and why they're important. Human rights and international law uh, are, are important because obviously they set sort of a baseline measure for uh, universal norms that apply to, to people all over the world, regardless of the, you know, the economic system, the political system, the, the nation state that they're in. Um, there are these universal norms that states, government actors are, are intended to respect and apply uh, for any person under their control. Um, when we talk about the international human rights framework, we talk about international law obligations, uh, which are the, the, the main sort of measure for what's happening in Israel-Palestine and what's happening to Palestinians, particularly Palestinian children in the context of, of what we'll be talking about here. Uh, that entire body of law, body of norms, really expanded following the Second World War. While many celebrated the end of the war, others, recognising that the horrors that had been perpetrated during the war could never be allowed to happen again, quickly pursued safeguards to protect all people in perpetuity. Recognition of individual and human rights for all proliferated and garnered wide acceptance globally. This included the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and then more general norms including the absolute prohibition against torture. More specialised treaties emerged in the 70s, 80s and 90s related to human rights, like the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The laws and customs of war uh, have, you know, over centuries been kind of the main measure of international law, um, the main sort of obligatory norms or customs uh, that that nation states or, you know, armed forces um, stretching back, you know, through the past several hundred years, um, that's been the main sort of international connection or international law-esque um, sort of framework. Uh, but after the Second World War, there really was uh, a real uh, global push for rights-based approach to a range of different issues and a range of different protections and guarantees individual to, you know, the person. Um, so that's where human rights law really began to sort of flourish uh, as these obligations and universal rights to individuals, um, not sort of collective rights or um, segmented rights where you'd be, you know, mainly focused on civilians or other protected persons, which is sort of the, the focus of international humanitarian law. Specific rights and specialized rights, specialized law related to children, um, they're important because children are different than adults. One example is the threshold for what amounts to torture. It's not a static threshold. It changes. It adapts. It's individualized. The definition of torture is meant to take into account, on a case-by-case -case basis, the suffering, pain, and mental anguish caused by an individual towards another. People who are 8, 12, 25, 36, 52, 80 are different people with different physical and psychological development and emotional capacities. So, uh, specialised international human rights law treaties 
they work to provide specific standards to measure specific conduct uh, and violations to you know the the recognizing the differences uh, of human beings across you know both uh, time, age, and uh, location, economic status, right? It, it's meant to build in um, rights and protections that are applicable uh, sort of globally in a range of different contexts. Um, so, you know, in some ways that's the, the greatness of a rights-based sort of legal order. Um, in other ways, it's, you know, it, it can sort of work against these, these basic rights um, because there's so much space for variables and interpretation um, that, you know, it, 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 on, on the, the practical side, it can limit implementation um, and, and, and be an obstacle uh, in itself. But generally, um, it is important to, to sort of have these specialized rights, specialized focus, um, because they sort of give guidance and direction um, in in specific contexts that go beyond sort of the the generally applicable norm um, that exists in international law. With the start and the creation and the ratification globally of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, that's where DCI, uh, the Defense for Children International Movement, really kind of became um, a force. The movement was first established in 1979, the International Year of the Child, as a worldwide grassroots network whose first major aim was to push for the ratification of the CRC. Once the CRC became a treaty and had been widely ratified and adopted, these national sections of the movement, of which there are now 38, pushed for implementation and accountability in their own specific contexts. Defense for Children International Palestine today is a local Palestinian child rights organization that pushes for implementation of the CRC um, in the occupied Palestinian territory, including uh, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. So the, those rights and norms that are recognized internationally, um, you know, Israel has uh, ratified the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, obligating themselves to actually respecting, protecting, and guaranteeing the rights included in the, the Convention. Um, the Palestinian Authority has as well. Um, but what we see is that these rights are not respected, they're not protected, uh, and they're not guaranteed to Palestinian children uh, living under Israeli military occupation. Um, and in the context of Israeli military detention, where Palestinian children are arrested and detained by Israeli forces um, in the West Bank, we see these rights kind of being actively and, and, and often sort of intentionally violated um, as part of the, the course of treatment that, that Palestinians face in that system. Israel occupied the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, in 1967, when Israeli forces entered and established authority in the territory following the Six-Day War. In doing so, Israel became the occupying power for purposes of international law, which carries clear obligations to protect the Palestinian civilian population under its control. Since then, Israel has operated two separate legal systems in the same territory. Israeli settlers live under civilian law, whereas Palestinians are subject to military law. Military law applies to this day uh, in the occupied Palestinian territory. And, you know, while military law uh, occupation is, uh, you know, essentially sanctioned by international law, um, you know, occupation is what happens after. Um, hostilities end, usually. Um, so international humanitarian law includes kind of the law of occupation, setting out uh, who, you know, who the occupying power is and what their obligations are to an occupied population. Um, so this is the current context in, in the, the occupied West Bank. Uh, Israeli forces 
are the occupying power. They'd institute a military law, um, which is sort of in practice, uh, a legal framework created by military orders. Military orders are documents that the military commander for a specific territory writes, signs, and then becomes the law of the territory. In the specific case of Israel's military occupation in Palestine, there are over 1,700 military orders. The military law touches on all aspects of Palestinian life. It regulates all manner of things, from traffic offences to what we would recognise as criminal law in a criminal code, and it goes beyond that as well. We have worked, um, you know, since 1991, representing Palestinian children in the, the Israeli military courts. Um, and, and in that time, you know, the, the legal framework itself is, is created to deny rights. Um, this isn't a system that sort of sets out and, and there's just, you know, some bad actors and uh, some rights are violated here and there. Um, the entire system is set up to, to target adolescent Palestinian boys from specific communities, uh, arrest them, deny them access to attorneys during interrogation, uh, essentially create some form of incriminating uh, statement or uh, confession that can gets passed to an Israeli military prosecutor to file charges in the military court against them. Children are arrested overwhelmingly on suspicion. What this means is that if an Israeli soldier driving down the road catches the face of a Palestinian boy in the mirror of the military vehicle he's driving, and he thinks that he might have seen that boy throwing a stone, say four months or four weeks or four days ago, then he can arrest the child. The soldier doesn't have to be 100% sure. He doesn't even have to be 10% sure. He doesn't even need evidence. There's no oversight over arrests. There's no oversight by an independent arbitrator. There's no process of gathering evidence to present to a judge who could decide to issue a warrant. When we say that the majority of Palestinian children are arrested on suspicion, we mean that they are often arbitrarily detained, without being told why, or given a warrant, suddenly, violently, being dragged from their beds, or taken as they walk home from school, or as they play with their friends. What we see from the documentation and the cases that we represent in the military courts, that it's really based on, you know, where children live. Uh, if you live in a Palestinian community located, you know, near a settlement, you're more likely to be targeted for arrest. If you live in a Palestinian community that's had weekly demonstrations against um, settlements, land confiscation, occupation, etc., uh, you are a, a higher risk of, of arrest as an adolescent boy in, in those communities. Um, so this is, you know, in, in, in a sense, when we talk about international law, when we talk about human rights, and we talk about uh, a state's obligation to people under their control, including children, to guarantee and respect these, these human rights. Um, I think in most contexts, there's this genuine, you know, good faith effort or deference um, that, that does exist in, in some cases. Um, but I think in, in the context of Israeli military occupation stretching on, you know, over half a century, um, there there is no intention to respect rights because the occupation, the treatment of children, the daily violence, the daily arrests, uh, it's all meant to control and occupy Palestinian population um, to further you know, annex, confiscate land and, and control uh, the specific territory to, to privilege Jewish Israelis, Israeli settlers, um, and dispossessed Palestinians, ultimately, of, of the land. Um, so it's not a justice system. It's not a system that's interested in protecting rights for Palestinians. Um, that's why it's, it's so important for the international community and, and our work um, at DCI Palestine to, to push for international recognition, um, affirmation and essentially accountability uh, so that rights are respected and uh, 
Palestinians sort of have what they deserve under international law um, and aren't stuck with sort of whatever it is that Israeli authorities will sort of allow. Israel is the only country in the world that automatically and systematically prosecutes children in military courts that lack fundamental fair trial rights and protections. Israel prosecutes between 500 and 700 Palestinian children in military courts each year. There is, you know, a, a majority of, of, of kids that DCI Palestine represents in the military courts are, are charged with throwing stones, which is a specific offense under the Israeli military law, um, which is quite unique in the sort of global context of, of criminal codes um, because it's, it's criminalizing the act of, of throwing an object. Uh, you don't have to cause any injury. You don't have to cause any damage. Uh, it really is the act of throwing um, that that is being criminalized by the the military law. Um, just to give a sense of kind of the breadth and scope of of the military law framework, um, almost every Palestinian political party is is deemed a banned organization. Um, under the military law framework. Um, this includes Fatah, which is the, the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, his uh, affiliation as political party. Um, so, you know, it, it's a context where, you know, the Palestinian president could be arrested at any moment by the Israeli authorities uh, and the arrest would be justified under the Israeli military law because he is a member of a banned organization. Um, and in the, the more politically focused uh, offenses, uh, you know, are, are all through the Israeli military law framework. Um, and it, it essentially means that anybody, you know, any Palestinian could be arrested at any time for anything. The one kind of piece of the legal framework in the West Bank that's um, you know, I think at the core, one of the main violations is that you have two separate laws for two separate people. Um, you have the military law being applied to the Palestinian population in the occupied West Bank. Uh, but for Israeli settlers, Israeli citizens that are living in the, the, same, the same area, the same occupied territory and illegal settlements, uh, Israeli authorities provide sort of the benefit of Israeli civilian law um, to Israeli settlers. So if you are an Israeli settler or you know, an Israeli settler child and you are accused or suspected of, of violating um, you know, some offense in the civilian law, and you're not going to be arrested from your home in the middle of the night. You'll be summoned for questioning. Um, you'll be you know, if you are prosecuted, you'd be prosecuted in a civilian court system inside Israel. Um, for Palestinians, right, the, the military court system um, is the system that applies to them. The military law is what regulates their life and what Israeli forces enforce in the occupied territory, despite the fact that under international law, international humanitarian law um, states explicitly that um, military law in an occupied territory applies to any person located in that territory. Um, so uh, the, 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 the basic sort of foundational structure of uh, the law of occupation, right, is Israeli authorities are really just taking, you know, the the guarantee of non-discrimination and throwing it out the window as they, you know, specifically apply military law to Palestinian population and, and Israeli settlers receive the benefit of, of broader protections um, of the Israeli civilian law. It's not only military detention that Palestinian children living under occupation are at risk of. We've been documenting Palestinian child fatalities and injuries at the hands of Israeli military and settlers in the occupied Palestinian territory since September 2000. In the West Bank, soldiers generally kill and injure Palestinian children in the context of Israeli military incursions, 
Palestinian demonstrations against Israeli settlements or the separation barrier, or as a result of settler attacks against Palestinian children. Children likewise sustain injuries when they are arrested, transferred and detained in Israeli interrogation centres and prisons. In the Gaza Strip, the majority of children are killed, injured or permanently disabled by Israeli forces during massive aerial and land offensives, which cause significant civilian casualties. In recent years, Israeli forces have increasingly shot and killed Palestinian children with live fire near the Gaza border fence during mass demonstrations asserting the right of Palestinians to return to their homes. Settler attacks, harassment and intimidation are also a daily occurrence for Palestinian children living near illegal Israeli settlements. We see violence uh, at the hands of Israeli soldiers and settlers um, sort of throughout the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and obviously in the Gaza Strip as well. Um, children are growing up in a hyper-militarized environment where um, Israeli soldiers and settlers essentially, um, you know, where there's friction points, which tend to be, uh, you know, Palestinian communities located near settlements, located near um, what you could say occupation infrastructure, um, military bases, the, the separation barrier, uh, roads used by soldiers and settlers, checkpoints, kind of wherever children and Palestinian families come into contact with Israeli forces, um, you know, there's, there's a likely chance that that interaction will result in, in some form of, of a human rights violation. Despite its clear obligations under international law, as well as long-term engagement by UN human rights bodies, governmental and non-governmental international Palestinian and Israeli organisations, Israeli authorities continue to administer and expand a vast web of unlawful practices in the occupied Palestinian territories that result in daily violations of children's rights. With international child rights being so widely accepted, why doesn't the international community, and why doesn't the United States government more strongly speak out and, and aim to hold Israel accountable for violations that are so well documented, so well known, and stretch back over decades? In the next episode, Shana Lowe, our US-based advocacy officer, will walk us through the experiences of Palestinian child detainees and give us an insight into DCI Palestine's global campaign to end the military detention of Palestinian children. No way to treat a child. Please make sure you're subscribed to the podcast on your favourite podcast app. Until then, you can find out more about our work on our website, dci-palestine.org. Thanks for listening.